Okay, I've been interested in uh, aircraft since I can remember. <laughs> it's literally every, it's in uh, my childhood, I built model airplanes, then I started designing and building model airplanes. Then I graduated to bigger model airplanes. In college, I did a lot of human-powered aircraft projects. Uh, you see two, two of the examples on the uh, upper right and lower left. And also I dabbled in human-powered hydrofoils which is just an airplane that flies underwater, so it's the same thing. Um, but the things I've been really interested in, pushing the limits of physical performance. What's the best you can possibly do within physical limits? And by best, I mean in terms of speed, range, endurance, the usual measures of figures of merit of airplanes. And with that, that led me to look at, if it's part of a team at MIT, look, look at an extraordinary machine, which is a passenger jet. And it's, I think most everybody's familiar with the jet, but I think there's some numbers that you're not familiar with. For example, well, okay, it's 10 times faster than a car, but it's also 100 times safer, given that high speed. What's really surprising, though, is how efficient it is. Most people think flying is, airplane is a fuel hog. Well, it's really not. If we look at a measure, which is a suitable for an airplane, which is not miles per gallon, but passenger miles per gallon, because, of course, airplane carries many more passengers, there you have to account for that. So the right figure of merit is the product of miles per gallon and number of passengers. And the latest airplane, as an example, the Boeing 787, has a PM and G, P passenger miles per gallon, if you like, of 120, and that's a very big number. If we compare it to typical automobiles, which are, at least for short trips, are alternatives to flying, take a uh, fully loaded small SUV, that's 100 passenger miles per gallon. A hybrid with two passengers is about the same, 100 miles per gallon, and the jet is much, much, much better than driving solo in the most fuel-efficient car you can buy. So, clearly, it's a very effective machine uh, today. First of all, and I will discuss some various uh, issues. Uh, oh, well, I'll discuss how to make this thing better. And first thing, I'd like to lay some ground rules. I'll be talking about subsonic airplanes, and there's a very good reason for that. If you compare subsonic, which means flying less than the speed of sound, about 85% of the speed of sound, which is what modern jet flies at, it's, uh, it does much, much better than the alternative flying supersonically. And the, the example I have there is the Concorde which flies about in Mach 2, um, which is about almost three times faster, not quite. It's tremendously more efficient to fly subsonically. And if you want to compare it to uh, a car, for example, what's the alternative to uh, flying a Concorde? Well, it is better than driving solo in a Hummer, but not much. <laughs> so clearly, we're going to stick, talk about subsonic airplanes. And the reason for this is fundamental. It's not because supersonic airplane designers don't know what they're doing. It's fundamental. Flying supersonically is just inherently more, uh, uh, takes inherently more fuel to do so for a given that distance. All right, well, let's look at progress. Uh, we had uh, airplanes started uh, about 110 years ago. 55 years later, we have what looks like the modern passenger jet, the first one, which is the Boeing 707. And uh, 55 years later, we have what looks like a 707. <laughs> so it seems like there's no progress. Actually, there has been a progress. It turns out the fuel economy has dramatically improved since the first passenger jet. So what is the reason for that? Well, if we look at the, what goes into passenger miles per gallon, it's a product of three things. One, it's the ratio of payload weight, and payload here is people plus luggage, divided by the total airplane weight. Weight is crucial in the flying. It seems, in, in, seems uh, obvious, perhaps, but it's much more and more important than in a car, in a passenger car. The second factor is the aerodynamic efficiency, lift to drag ratio. And the third one, which is the most important, that's where the progress has occurred the most, is engine efficiency. In fact, most of the benefits uh, going from the 707 to the 787 has been because of engine efficiency. So, what else can we do? Well, one of the things that helps with engine efficiency, in fact, if you go back, notice the engines have changed quite a bit. They're much bigger, uh, and there's only two of them, but the total engine area is much greater now. 
So what can we do? Well, we can make the engine really big by removing this annoying duct around it to enable making the engine bigger. And that does help about 10, 15% better in terms of passenger miles per gallon. However, it's noisy. And, and that, pro that essentially makes it a non-starter given the constraints on current airports. What else can we do? We can try different configurations. The conventional airplane is what we call nowadays a cantilever wing and tube body. So cantilever wing means just straight wing, nothing else, and the tube is the fuselage. So that is a called a wing tube configuration, and it's been around since the 707. Seems to be the best. Well, people have examined different types. This is called a blended wing body, where the fuselage and the wing are morphed into one uh, unit. There's alternatives to the cantilever wing, such as stress bracing. Uh, that's called a truss braced wing. And these do, do perform better, at least the initial testing. However, they're risky. They're two different airplane companies. Don't like to build them because they do represent a big leap of faith that this will work. So what else can we do to, not to maintain the wing tube configuration, but maybe improve things? One other thing is we can re-examine the, the nature of airplane propulsion. For example, here's the standard, what we call conventional propulsion. The body or the fuselage and the wings generate what's called a draft or wake. Race cars use this to advantage, so do bicycle racers. And that wake essentially has to be overpowered by the engine, jet, going the other way. And when, they two, when the two are equal and opposite, the airplane flies straight and level. Unfortunately, these two jets in opposite directions represent energy. And, and energy takes fuel. And this is one of the major losses of uh, aero propulsion. Well, instead of having a separate engine, we can make the airplane cover its tracks. This is called bond layer ingesting propulsion, where you put the engine in the draft and cancel it, not overpower it. It's kind of a more economical way to uh, propel an airplane, and it does work. And essentially, there's less violence left behind, if you will, and less fuel is required to do that. And to this gives you at least five, to maybe up to 10% better uh, mileage compared to the alternative. And it's quiet, so it's quite feasible. OK, with all that as background, essentially, I would like to describe to you the DA double bubble aircraft which you've been working on at MIT for the past two and a half, three years. And the initial estimates indicate that its potential potentially can have up to 160 or as high as 200 passenger miles per gallon, which is a very large improvement over the current jets. I'd like to describe how is that possible and what goes into that. OK, so here's the comparison on top view, uh, compared what I would call the equivalent re uh, airplane which we hope to replace as it's being phased out. On the left, you see the Boeing 737-800, which is probably the airplane you would take flying coast to coast in the United States. It weighs about 170,000 pounds, and it has a PSP, MP, PMPG of 100. Li not quite as good as the current jets, because that's an older airplane, but it does pretty well. On the right, you see the D8, one of its variants, the D8.2. One of the things you notice is the boxes are seats. So it's a twin aisle. It's instead of three and three across, it's two, 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 with two aisles. Uh, it's fewer rows, and they both carry the same number of 180 passengers. And one of its major benefits is it's lighter. That it's, that's one of the things it's responsible for. It's less f uh, lower fuel burn. And also, it's, uh, it, it, its engines are boundary layer ingesting. And that's part of it. And essentially, we have what's called, well, actually, here's the top view as well, the fuselage, and the side view, comparing the, the two. And on the left, you see the front views. And the double bubble is, you see the fuselage is essentially is two bubbles, like soap, like soap bubbles stuck together in a front view. Um, and again, you see the fuselage is a little more detailed. OK, now let me describe what, why is this configuration Look the way it does. What's with the funny upturned nose? Uh, what, what are some of the uh, key benefits? One of the things that widening the fuselage, making the fuselage wider into a twin aisle, it makes the fuselage carry a larger fraction of the lift, about 7% more. You think that's not a big deal. Yes, but you can shrink the wing by that much because it no longer has to do as much work. So widening the fuselage helps in that regards. 
Furthermore, the lift on the fuselage is carried far forward as a result of the upturned nose. And that's the main reason for that funny shape up front. What does that do? Well, think of the airplane as a teeter-totter, balancing on its center of gravity. And if you put, have an upward force in the front, you need less download from the tail. The tail shrinks, the tail pushes down less, and that makes th means the wing has to lift that much less also, and that shrinks the wing even more. So all these things just add up, little 3% here, 5% here, and pretty soon you have a pretty big number. And that's essentially the baseline. It's, it's, this is called synergy, where the uh, net gain of all the pieces taken together can be amplified by the snowball effect, compound interest, if you like, into a much bigger number when you put them all together in a synergistic way. Okay, uh, the airplane is designed to fly a little slower. In fact, that's what enables the wings to be unswept and lighter. I think slower speed, that, that's going backwards. We really want, don't want to fly slower. Well, what really matters is not the time from takeoff to touchdown. What matters is the time from gate to gate. And the fact is, the fact that you have twin aisles and much fewer rows, you avoid the usual musical chair, uh, musical chair dance that you have when you load an airplane. There's a lot less of it. You have twin aisles, and you only have two seats on each side. And a simple estimate indicates that the airplane will load and unload faster by about 15 minutes at each end. And there, in fact, that almost exactly cancels the lower speed. So the gate-to-gate -gate time cross-country is at about the same. And in fact, for shorter flights, the airplane is faster, paradoxically, even though it flies slower. So, where do we go from here? Uh, the, so far, we've been on, embarked on a uh, project at MIT to examine this configuration in much more detail. And we're at the preliminary technology development stage. We're doing some tests. Uh, we're still underway, but about a year to go, and it's supported by NASA and we're partnering with other companies. But to make this thing a reality, really, an airplane company have, will have to pick it up. Okay, we don't have an airplane company out in the back at MIT. It's, it's a big enterprise. And in fact, if you notice the vertical scale on this chart, those are, that's a, let's say, exponential logarithm. It's a semi-log plot. And yes, building a new airplane from scratch takes billions of dollars with a B. And we just don't have that kind of money. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, so essentially we're trying to demonstrate the, this technology and hope that an air, air, uh, air, airframe company like Boeing or Airbus, or maybe there's others, will pick it up. And we're looking at about five to eight years from the word go to when a prototype would happen. And uh, again, that's again typical time required to make, make a project like this happen. So let me just uh, describe some of the, the technology development that we're working on right now. Currently in the wind tunnel, in fact, you saw at the back, is the wind, uh, 20 to 1 scale model. That's actually a real wind tunnel model that goes into a wind tunnel to do aerodynamic tests on that configuration. And you see that on the upper left. Uh, and that was put into the Wright Brothers wind tunnel at MIT. In the works, in the next few months or so, we'll put in a much bigger model, which has engines in it. And we hope to uh, perform tests on that very shortly and over the next course of six, uh, six months or so. And for the really definitive tests, we have a very large uh, quarter, quarter scale model that just will not fit in our wind tunnel, so we have to go to NASA Langley. They have a much bigger facility. These boxes and ovals are the tun wind tunnel cross sections that you see here, and you can see a six foot human there to scale. So some of the other examples, this is uh, having boundary layer ingestion requires redesigning the engines because you just can't take one off the shelf and drop it in. It probably will not work. So we need to redesign the components and we're doing testing on scale models there. And also we have the uh, 120th scale model that I just showed in the sketch. This is what it looks like in the wind tunnel. It test, it's tested at about 100, 100 to 120 miles an hour. And we do all sorts of measurements, uh, flow visualization, and force test, and so on. So the, uh, that's the, my story. And again, i just like to present this concept that we're working on. And we're hoping to change the look of commercial aviation if it goes forward. Thank you. <laughs>